Now, in some of the Dexander products, right? So you, the 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 financial advisor may receive money or property, right, in regard to the to to the business uh, that the financial advisor is undertaking, right? So, in the course of the business, the financial advisor may receive money or property, right? And under A section twenty eight, now that provides for 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 the procedures. All right, that, that 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 governs the the receipt of money and the paying out of money. All right. All right. So section twenty eight provides some specified circumstances under which the financial advisor uh, may receive or deal with the client's money or property. Okay. So five point four refers to a lien or a claim on the client's money. <laughs> All right. So this under the regulations is void. Uh, unless the monies in the account are for fees due and owing to the financial to the licensed financial advisor, right? So a lien or a claim on the client's property in any account is void, unless this money are owing to the corporation, right? And similarly, uh, any charge or mortgage on client's money or property in the account, okay, which may be required to be established, also shall be void. So therefore, client's money is client's money. Client's property is client's money. All right, unless under the law you are entitled to it, you cannot put lay a claim. You cannot put a charge or a mortgage on client's money <coughs> or client's property. Okay. So that is in regard to section twenty-eight. All right. Uh, yeah. Then coming down to six obligation to furnish information. Now this is a general section under twenty-nine. Where the MS requires financial advisor, licensed financial advisor, uh, to comply with this obligation to furnish information. All right. So this is, uh, as I said before, this is a notice. So it, it has a force of law. It has legal effect. So you have to comply. All right. So MS may decide one day to say, "Look, I, I want you to give me this, that, and the other information." <coughs> And your answer is yes. I will supply you this information within reasonable time. All right. And uh, if you don't comply, then Section Six Point Three says that well, the penalty is there, right? So as I've said before, January is twenty-five thousand. In this case, they also have an imprisonment term of not exceeding twelve months or both. All right. All right. So you refuse if 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 the, if the financial advisor, the licensed financial advisor, refuse to to furnish information as Required or directed by the MES, then then the financial advisor corporation liable upon conviction uh, in breach of this particular section liable to the penalty stated under six point three. Now very quickly, I want to move into part three of the FAA conduct of business. All right, division one is general. All right. Uh, now we look at. Division two, all right. So division one, as I said, is general on the a paragraph one, a paragraph one point one of chapter three, all right. Division one is general. Now division two, part three of the FAA under division two life insurance. So under paragraph seven, they talk about insurance broking premium accounts, all right. Now here, this is again a procedural thing. And as far as the <coughs> and as far as the licensed financial advisor is concerned, when you receive money, you should ex establish and maintain a separate account with the bank licensed under the Banking Act. All right. So it must be a bank. It must be a recognized bank licensed under the Banking Act for you to open a separate account if you are dealing with life insurance uh, broking premium contracts. Okay. All right. So I do not wish to again go into the details. It is quite. Uh, Self-explanatory there. <coughs> okay, that's under A where you need to have a separate account. You cannot mix up money uh, uh, in terms of uh, money received from uh, insurance. Uh, in terms of receiving insurance money. Okay. Now B are the conditions for withdrawal. All right, that's set up quite clearly. Section A, B, C, and D. <coughs> right. So, uh, what well again? That is quite self-explanatory. So, no financial advisor shall withdraw money from the bank account maintained by unless for any of the following reasons. 
All right, so it's quite clear cut. You can only withdraw money based on A, B, C, and D. <coughs> just just to, to, to in, in passing mention 7.3D, any repayment money that are paid into the account in error. Now sometimes you may bank in wrongly and that one of course you can take it out if it's uh, money wrongly paid into the account, right? <coughs> now paragraph C there refer to the return or loss on investment. Now this is again uh, uh, important for the licensed financial advisor. So you make any losses over the account, well, you've got to make up the difference, right? right? And then the D, very quickly, that's in terms of interest and income. <coughs> now, section 7.6 there, we'll talk about the interest and the income and when the, the and who the, the interest belong to, right? And whether the financial advisor, all right, is entitled to receiving the interest and other income. That's under 7.6. All right. So 7.7, .7, there's a credit period which you may wish to take note of. In terms of receiving uh, int uh, interest income or other types of income. All right. <coughs> and whether the income belongs to the insurer or belongs to the financial advisor, licensed financial advisor in that regard. Okay. <coughs> So that is quite uh, uh, operational in terms of uh, uh, life insurance. Now, again, related to life insurance uh, under this particular section, Division 2, <coughs> uh, Paragraph 8 talks about negotiation and placement, placements of risk with unlicensed insurers. <laughs> right. Now the key point is, of course, look at 8.4. There, there is certain limitation, there is certain uh, uh, restriction uh, regarding place negotiation of placement of risk with unlicensed insurers. All right, under 8.1, look at the second line. This is a prohibition against negotiation and placement of risk with unlicensed insurers, except where specifically permitted by the MAS. All right. Now, of course, this particular provision does not re uh, does not apply to reinsurance businesses relating to risk outside Singapore, or other such risks as may be prescribed by the MAS. That's under nine eight point two. All right. The rest again is is pretty uh, straightforward. All right. So eight point three talks about uh, the definition under the Insurance Act, Section three of the Insurance Act. All right that prohibits carrying on of any class of insurance business in Singapore as insurer by a person unless that person is licensed by the NMAS under the Insurance Act, right? So therefore, not an, any Tom, Dick, or Harry actually can can uh, can carry on the insurance business in Singapore. It must be licensed by the NMAS as provided for under the Insurance Act, right? Any class of insurance. And if you contravene, if there's a contravention of Section Three of the Insurance Act, then it's a criminal offence. And as you may well know, criminal offence normally carries heavy penalties. <coughs> now, what is the reason? What is the requirement? Or what is the reason, rather, or for a requirement? All right, in terms of negotiation and placement of risk with unlicensed insurers. All right. <coughs> now, eight point four states very clearly: the above requirements <coughs> are to target the increased use of the internet for the sale and distribution of financial products, including insurance. <coughs> So with the with the with the wider use of the internet, every every per person may want to sell you some financial product, including insurance, all right? Including people outside Singapore. All right? So you have people from A UK, you know, Hong Kong, Japan, anywhere. They want to sell you insurance in Singapore, all right? So under the internet they will they will market and they will and they, they will sell insurance to you, all right, to consumers in Singapore. Uh, and as a result of which, well, there, there may be mis-selling and, 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 and the retail consumers in particular uh, may be taken for a ride. Right? So if you cast your eye quickly across the page to A, I want you to understand the rationale why th there's this law under section 33. All right? Now, I just read to you very quickly. Individuals are not prohibited from purchasing life policy from I and license overseas insurer. All right. So you are not, not really prohibited from buying, right, if you want to. 
because this is extra uh, territory, all right? However, financial advisors are required to seek the approval of the MAS should they wish to place their client's life insurance risk with unlicensed overseas insurance. <coughs> okay? So you must have approval. If you, if you rely on a, on a foreign insurer to underwrite the risk, so you have to need to get MAS approval. This is to ensure that no license, no financial advisor is being used by unlicensed overseas insurers to assist them to write domestic Singapore risk. Since under the law, unlicensed overseas insurers are not allowed to carry on business in Singapore as an insurer. Now that refers back to section 3 of the Insurance Act at 8.3, at paragraph 8.3. All right. So these insurers may be licensed overseas, all right? but as far as we are concerned, they are not licensed in Singapore under, <coughs> under Section 3 of the Insurance Act. And therefore, if they are not licensed, they are unlicensed. All right? So we cannot allow a financial advisor to be made use of by li or unlicensed overseas insurers to assist them to write domestic Singapore risk. Primarily because the unlicensed overseas insurers are unlicensed. They are not allowed to carry on insurance business in Singapore. And the clients are in Singapore. All right. The other, the other reason for the law of certain prohibition against placement and negotiation of risk with unlicensed insurers, overseas insurers, are at 8.8. .8. The other reason is at 8.8. .8. Generally, life insurance needs of domestic market are adequately met by licensed life insurers in Singapore. Right? So we have to recognize that we have a very sophisticated life insurance uh, industry in Singapore. However, MAS does recognize that where there are special needs that cannot be met by our local insurance industry, the MAS is prepared to permit such risks to be placed directly with unlicensed insurers on a case-by-case -case basis. Again, you see the philosophy of, of, of the balance approach, right? <coughs> They're not saying, no, you cannot. The answer is, you're not prohibited. You can do so, right? But subject to approval because we don't want our uh, retail investor to be shortchanged, right? To pay money by, uh, by, by uh, insurers overseas, all right? And when they market and distribute the products over the internet. Okay, that covers very quickly <coughs> uh, paragraph 8 in terms of uh, uh, life insurance policies, the conduct of life insurance policies in, in Singapore under the Financial Advisors Act. Now look at paragraph 9, representations by licensed financial advisors. Okay. Now representations are essentially statements <coughs> Licensed financial advisors <coughs> make statements uh, in regard to their their, 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 their business and therefore, it, therefore Section 34 set up some of these provisions. <coughs> now again, this regard to the life insurance business in regard to uh, the proposed contract insurance uh, in terms of the proposal form. And of course, as, as financial advisor, <coughs> working, in working in conjunction or in relation with the insurer, so it says very quickly at 9.2 that no licensed financial advisor shall with intent to deceive. All right? Again, it is this intent. Under criminal law, intent is very important. This is called the mens rea. All right? You must have this intention. All right? right on a form or... Any matter that's material to the contract that's false or misleading in a material particular. Again, what is material is subject to the reasonable test, okay, reasonable person's test, the prudent insurer's test, right? Or whether that the particular insurer is induced by, by, by this particular fact to enter into a contract, right? So generally under the law, there are two tests under the prudent insurer's test or whether the actual insurer is being induced to enter into this particular contract. Mm -hmm. So therefore, as far as the proposed contract insurance is concerned, the financial advisor must not make any statement that is misleading or false in any material that is particular. Right? 
or meet to disclose under B to the insurer any matter that's material to the proposed contract. Uh, that the C is the advice or induce the intending insured to write on the form. Right? If you are representing the, you are talking to the, the retail person, the insured person, you advise or induce the, intent, the intended, intending insured, the prospective insured, right? To write something that's, in, that, that's false or misleading to the insurer. That means if you are helping the, 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 the proposed insured, right? To, to, you are talking to the pro proposed insured to fill up a form, and then write something that is, that, that is misleading or something or omit something that is material, right? That's under paragraph D, omission, right? Or making a representation that is false and misleading, right? So in and so far as insurance company is concerned, again, this honesty bit is very important. <coughs> so when you are financial advisor in relation to an insurer, because that the relationship between the financial advisor and the insurer, so you must make sure that in the in the proposed contract of insurance, there's there there is nothing of the kind where your representations are, are misleading or false, right? Either on your own accord as a representative or as a financial advisor corporation, or uh, advising or inducing the proposed insured to do the same, meaning making false or misleading statement or omitting um, a, a, a material that is um, a, 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 a fact or a matter that's material, right? So that's in terms of the proposed contract insurance that, that the financial advisor puts up to the insurer, right? Now under B, supposing now the insured makes a claim on the on the policy that has been uh, advised by you by the financial advisor corporation, then what happens? Mm. Now that's under B nine point three. All right, the 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 law is similar in that it states clearly no finance no licensed financial advisor shall if intend to deceive in relation to a claim under a contract insurance. Now it's a similar thing. The first one is in terms of the proposed in the proposal form. All right. In this particular section, B93, is in terms of making a claim. So the financial advisor representative may fill up the form in whole or in part, all right, to the insurer. And when you fill up the form, the claim form, and you put in the claim form some information that's false or misleading or in a, mati in a, in a material particular, then that amount to false representation. It's a misrepresentation, all right, a false representation. Or you are made to disclose to the insurer any matter that's material to the claim. Right? Or you induce the insured to fill up in whole or in part. Right? And you give some information that's false or misleading in a material particular. Or you advise or induce the, the insured to omit to disclose something that's material to the claim. Right? Uh, the, I, I, I can see that A, B, C, D and A, B, C, D, the law is similar. All right? In regard to putting up a proposal for insurance, in the first part at, at 9.2 and uh, on the second part at 9.3 we are looking at putting up a claim so if any of the four uh, 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 matters referred therein is false or misleading then what happens is penalties will attach right and of course the insurance company will not no, will not want to 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 honor the the contract because it's false and misleading all right in terms of A, probably the insurer will, will try to, to avoid the contract or avoid the contract, depending whether the whether there's a basis clause or, or, or whether there is a warranty uh, as regard to, to the information that is put onto the proposal form. Uh, similarly, uh, under B, under a claim, all right, so if the, in, if the insured person put up a false claim or a fraudulent claim or misle misleading claim, then the insurance company actually may be able to void the contract or avoid the contract, all right, for 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 breach of the the Ubaramadi's uh, the, the utmost good faith principle, right? Uh, we will talk about that maybe some other time in terms of life insurance. Uh, especially, I think many of you there will know that a life insurance contract is uh, is uh, follow the principle utmost good faith, right? And we we leave that for the for the time being. In any event, if, if a proposal or a claim has to be made fraudulently, right, based on, on misrepresentation by the 
financial advisor to the life insurer, then 9.4 provides the, the penalty, right? And I want you, I'm to emphasize this particular point. Any licensed financial advisor who contravenes this particular section shall underline this one, uh, notwithstanding that a contract of insurance does not come into being. Right? That's in re reference to the proposal for an insurance policy. All right? You put up a proposal and the uh, end of the day, the insurance company says, no, we don't want to, uh, we don't want to accept the, 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 the policy, we don't want to underwrite the risk, sorry, you know, go to another insurance company. Now, notwithstanding that the contract of insurance does not come into being, the minute you commit the offence of helping or of, of putting up a false representation or misrepresentation to the insurer or helping the proposed insured to put up a proposal that is not, that is false, uh, that, that contains false and misleading statements to a material particular, then an offence has been committed. All right? So the, the part that you must understand is notwithstanding that a contract of insurance does not come into being, okay, the financial advisor shall be guilty of an offence and again you can see the penalty there is quite quite uh, tough, quite uh, not exceeding 25,000 which is okay and I mean companies some, 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 sometimes can pay but the key part is imprisonment or term of exceeding 12 months or both. Alright, so who is that person who, 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 who put up a false um, representations or misrepresentation to the insurer or induce the insured to put up, uh, you know, misrepresentations? Right? Then that particular person or that particular financial advisor corporation may be subject to a fine and that natural person, the individual, alright, who, who does those things may be, well, jailed for a term of not exceeding 12 months. So this is again is a is a serious thing in regard to the conduct of business for life insurance, right? Okay. Now, under the next part, part three of the FAA, uh, conduct of business. So the division one will refer to general, division two will refer to life insurance, which I've just covered, and now we are looking at division three, specified products. Now. These specified products actually refer to the disclosing of certain interests. <laughs> All right? Now, specified products are sometimes what we call very um, specific products. Right? Some are specified products. Some of these specified products are listed. Some of these specified products are unlisted. We will come to that later on in, in, in this program. All right? <coughs> so here we are trying to look at Conflict of interest. How if how a financial advisor can avoid conflict of interest situations between the financial advisor on the one hand and the clients on the other hand, right? Now, ten point one uh, gives you the, the the basic principle behind it. A financial advisor should act in the best interest of his clients in providing services to them. So the keyword there is the best interest. So. In order to achieve that particular objective, to give best, to serve the best interest of the client, all right. Now, one of the, the ways to do that is where there is a conflict of interest situation, all right. And sometimes such conflict cannot be avoided, right, because the financial advisor corporation may have some interest in certain products, all right. So they have investments in certain products. Or they have certain, they have an intention to invest in certain products. All right. And at the same time, you're asking the client to also buy these same products. All right. So there can be a conflict of interest. All right. Either you're buying these products or you're selling these products on the part of the financial advisor corporation. And at the same time, you're advising client to do the same, either buy or sell, or worst case, opposite. You are selling and you're asking the client to buy, all right? A certain specific products, all right? So in that case, if you are selling, the financial advisor corporation is selling, and you're advising the client to buy, then obviously there's a conflict of interest. So therefore, in order to treat the clients fairly and equitably, you have to inform the client of your holding or your holdings of uh, certain interest in this product, or your intention 
in dealing with the, the, these products. Let's say I intend to, the financial advisor corporate intend to buy. All right, then you ask the, 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 the clients to buy. Even in this respect, there is a conflict of interest, all right? Because if there's a lot of buying, the prices of these products, uh, whatever these products are, the prices of whatever these products are will rise. Because more, I mean, when, when you buy, the prices of products will normally go, uh, go up. So how do we resolve this conflict of interest? And that is where this particular uh, section comes in. All right, there's section 36 of the, of the FAA. All right, so A says very clearly there, dispo disclosure of potential and actual conflicts of interest. All right. So here again, it's quite procedural at 10.2. All right, so the section 36.1 must be read together with section 23.4 and section 37. This is quite complicated, as I said. Uh, sections of the act are very difficult to read, like what I told you earlier in chapter 1. All right. So what happens here is it simply it simply means that when you have this particular conflict of interest, all right, whether potential or actual, you need to inform the client, all right, inform the client very clearly, a concise statement, all right, simple and concise, easy to understand, of the nature of any interest in, or any interest in acquisition. That means you buy or dispose or you sell of the specified products that he or the person associated with or connected with him as at the date of which the circular or other communication is sent. Right, to put it very briefly, you've got to inform the client in order to avoid any conflict of interest. Right? So that's under A 10.2 10 to 10.3. Right? Now under B, defense for failure to disclose. Well, MS uh, sometimes uh, sometimes uh, uh, make sure that you know, that there, there is no uh, prescriptive and, and, and one size fit all thing. You know, but sometimes you may you may you know not fail to disclose, all right? Failure to disclose, then what happens? All right. Now, should a licensed financial advisor be charged, okay, with failure to disclose conflict of interest? It shall be a defense for him if he could prove that at the time of the representation he was not aware. Or could not reasonably to have been aware that he had an interest in, or an interest in the acquisition or disposal of the product, or that particular person associated with or connected to him and an interest in, or an interest in the acquisition or disposal of the product. Right. So therefore, there's this duty, there's this obligation to disclose any potential conflict of interest in regard. To your clients, right? To the clients of the financial advisor corporation. And the rationale for it is very simple. Ten point five says, disclosure should be seen as part of the efforts by the MAS to aim at helping the customers to make informed decisions, right? All right. So the key word is informed decision. You give enough information. You disclose enough information for the client to enable the client to make informed decision whether to buy or to sell, right? Well, uh, C at 10.6 provide the penalty. Again, I will want to direct your interest. If you, if you fail to disclose a uh, uh, conflict of interest, all right, and and the and the courts find that there is this that this breach of this particular duty, well, the penalty for contravening the the section 36 of this particular act is given in at 10.6. Again, I want to draw your attention to the simple thing of the imprisonment term. All right, anything that carries the imprisonment term is a very, is a serious thing. All right, ten point six a again is twelve months. All right, or both. A penalty of twenty five thousand dollars or imprisonment term of not exceeding twelve months. Okay. Now, section D provides another procedural issue, uh, another legal issue. All right, a related issue here is imposes the condition, is the imposition of a condition. All right, especially when you're doing listed specified products. All right, so you have to maintain a register of your interest in the listed specified products. All right, so this is procedural. You must maintain a register of of his interest in the listed specified products. And then B is quite clear. Enter in the register within seven days. Underline that, right? There's a timeline. Within seven days after the date he acquires any interest in the listed specified products. All right? So the date of acquisition, the particular...
particulars of the lizard special products, the name, the details, all right, and the particulars of the interest in those specified products. Right, and they're going to retain a copy of this in easily accessible form. Right, so the MAS can check check it out. Right, and then for a period of not less than five years after the date on which such entry was first made. Right, right, S there, 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 there is a, a, a legal legal procedure on this. It's procedural law. Ensure that a copy of the register is kept in Singapore. Right, so MAS view conflict of interest as as a very serious thing. Right, so you need to keep a register. You need to record the date where you acquire the interest and and the type of interest and the particular of the interest and so on. Now, ten point eight. Furthermore, when there's any change in any interest in the listed specified products, right, <coughs> the relevant person is required to enter the particulars of the change. Right, so if you sell, you buy, you buy a little bit more, you sell some, but you don't sell all. So if there are any changes in the particulars, all right, you have to record the change within seven days from the date of the change, and you got to retain the entry for five years, right, as before. All right. So again, it shows you the importance or making sure that there's no conflict of interest, right? So MS is going to track <coughs> any conflict of interest situation, potential or otherwise. In the event that there is a complaint by a customer that look, all right, they ask me to buy this product, but it's a big conflict of interest, all right, and I and I lose on this particular product because of the conflict. All right. So they want you to keep records all right, all right, of any acquisition, disposal or any change. And that record must be kept for at least five years, okay? Not less than five years. Not less than five, at least five years, okay? And any changes in your interest, okay, must be recorded in the register within seven days from any change, okay? And 10.9. At the same time, there's a regulation 20B under the FAR. As I said before in Chapter 1, the FAR gives you more meat, gives you more content to the FAA. And now the regulation 20B of the FAR states very clearly that the relevant person shall keep the register of his interest in the listed specified products referred to in regulation 20A of the FAR FAR in the case of an individual person at the principal place of business. All right. In the case of a corporation or any of its places of business, okay. And of course, a register of interest can be kept in any form, la. electronic form or paper form, right? In so far as this register can be uh, used as evidence in court, all right. All right. The 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 person who keep the records must ensure there's full access, all right, and. Uh, the access must be must mu must be given within reasonable time. All right, if the MA should ask for these records, and ten point eleven talk about a licensed financial advisor maintaining records at places at which the representative kept the registers of interest in the list of specified product, and places at which copies of the registers are kept in Singapore. Okay, there's a regulation under twenty A one four. Right, they provide for where and how these records must also be kept. Okay. okay. And ten point twelve, as I've said before, authorities inspection of the record and the authority is allowed to make a copy or extract from such record. Right? So and uh, as usual, if you contravene this, guilty of an offence, right? So that is in terms of uh, very quickly the specified product in terms of any conflict of interest. Okay. Uh, now. now, let's take a look at the very quickly paragraph 11. Now, this again, we are looking at the conduct of business under part 4 of the FAR. Now, this one is in regard to conditions governing the granting of unsecured advances, loans, and credit facilities 
all right, to a director of a finance license company or to any other officer or employee of the licensed financial advisor. All right, this is provided for under 11.1. It is fairly uh, uh, self-explanatory, uh, so I don't want to go into that in detail. Now look at B, there's also a definition there of in relation to regulation 18 of the financial advisors regulation. Uh, again, it's self-explanatory. The definition of a director. <laughs> all right. Uh, before that, uh, just one, one, one. The just before that, right? Uh, which in the aggregate and outstanding of any one time exceeds three thousand dollars. Okay. So in terms of granting of unsecured advances, loans, or credit facilities, all right, there is a limit of maximum three thousand dollars, which the financial advisor which the licensed financial advisor can grant, okay? No, okay? Now, uh, moving down to B11.2, definition of a director, well, this one is self-explanatory, <laughs> right? So the market value, right? Market value in relation to the assets, which are specified products listed for quotation or quoted on proof. Uh, uh, this meaning the market value in terms of the assets of the company. Uh, in relation to whether a, finan a licensed financial advisor can grant unsecured advances, loans, and credit. Right? So there's a market value involved in terms of the what is the market value? How to set the market value in relation uh, to the assets of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of, of the specified products? Now, one, two, and three again is self explanatory, so I don't think I'm going to go into it. But in the event that the, the, the products are not transacted, right? so paragraph B2 provides you with the 30 days. Right? If there's no trading in the special products on the immediately preceding business day, right? then subject to point three, all right, the lower of the last transacted price and the last bid price of the specified products in the immediately preceding 30 days. All right? So if there's no trading, they are looking at 30 days. All right, between the lower of the last transact price and the last bid price. All right. Now, paragraph three says if there was no trading at all in the special products in the immediately preceding 30 days, that's to qualify <coughs> two above, then the value of the special products are estimated by the exchange, all right, by the relevant exchange where the products are listed. All right. Or in the absence of such a value, all right, zero value or any other value as approved by the authority. Okay. Uh, I stopped here for a while. I got an urgent phone.